Thank you very much, Alyssa. Let me also um, forgot I need to uh, make, make one announcement about one of the big Kennedy Center events tomorrow. There will be the ISP, right, International Study Program, or Study Abroad Open House or uh, Fair tomorrow. I guess we call it a fair because it's actually going to be outside, right, directly uh, to the east of the building here. And so um, please come and check that out. Um, all right. Well, today's panel discussion uh, represents the first instance of, of something that we're going to try to do going forward. Um, as you know, BYU has a terrific international cinema program here. Oh, by the way, there are four prime empty seats right in front of me, right here. If you're looking for a seat, um, please come and take one of those. Uh, also, uh, a couple to my right in the first row as well. Um, and that is what we will, we will sort of have, try to have a tie-in every semester, a film that addresses some of the issues that are raised uh, through our lecture series. Um, and we hope to, so this is the first one of those. And so the film that was being shown is this film called Poverty, Inc. And um, this is a, a film that takes on issues relevant to international aid, international development, um, and we're, this is, we're going to be talking about, of course, today, the issues that are there. But just for your information, you can see the film, if this raises your interest, tomorrow at 5 p.m. And following the screening of the film, at the end of it, Scott Sanders, one of our participants today, will in fact uh, be answering questions. There will be a question and answer, answer session after that. So here, of course, you'll hear from him, but if you want him, sort of ask him some questions that are more directly related to the film itself, please keep that in mind. And there is a second screening on Saturday at 3.30 p.m. Okay, let me briefly um, introduce our panel here. So I've already mentioned Scott Sanders. He's an assistant professor of sociology uh, here at BYU, has done uh, quite a bit of work in this area, as have all of our panelists today. Uh, we also have Todd Manwaring, who's uh, an associate teaching professor at the Marriott School here at BYU and the managing director, excuse me, of the Ballard Center for Economic Self-Reliance. And then we also have Olga Stoddard, who's an assistant professor of economics here at BYU. I'm grateful for all three of them uh, to, to, to join us here today. Now, what I want to do here is we're going to show you the trailer for the film. Just two minutes long, and it just gives you, I think, a good sort of overview of what the issues are it raises, and certainly it's, um, it's slant, because it certainly has a particular viewpoint it, it puts across. So if we could have uh, the trailer now, that would be great. Machiavelli said, the reason there will be no change is because the people who stand to lose from change have all the power. And the people who stand to gain from change have none of the power. That's describing the global aid system today. I'm glad people want to help. It comes from a good heart. People give us food, they dig us wells, they bring us shoes, they encourage others to give. The problem is, it does not work. The foreign aid amounted to a huge subsidy, hundreds of millions of dollars. Tom's shoes found the right model that captured this love of people who want to be generous and helpful. Our donations have an unpredictable impact on the local economy. Why would you go buy something that's for free? Emergency disaster relief has become a permanent model. After 40 years, if you're still here, there's a problem. What happened to our cotton farms? That's all gone because of the negative impact of the imports at a second-hand level. If we rich countries that produce a lot of food should sell it to poor countries, it has not worked. It actually created more poverty. We don't need one more celebrity doing one more campaign. What we need is to no longer be excluded. No one wants to be a beggar for life. I know about 
countries that developed on trade and innovation and business. I don't know of any country that got so much aid to suddenly became a first world country. If you really want to help the poverty industry as we know it has to go. The sooner we tell a beautiful story about the African entrepreneur doing amazing work, then we will begin to shift mindsets. They're not just led. They have hope. They have a way to get out of it. There's a way to fix it. When you do something, you can see the impact on the population, and you can say, this is because of me. But having a heart for the poor isn't hard, but having a mind for the poor, that's the challenge. Okay. Um, so you can see there that the, the, the film presents a pretty uh, definite viewpoint, right? International aid is bad, <laughs> okay? Not to put too fine a point on it. And that is, and, it, and it, you know, you'll see, if you watch the film, there are some, there, there, there's, some, there's some pretty persuasive evidence. But on the other hand, we know that over the last 30 years or so, there has been significant progress. One of my uh, friends, Dan Nielsen, professor of political science, who's on leave this semester, so could not be here, uh, sent me a statistic that says since between 1990 and 2018, roughly 1.4 billion people left extreme poverty throughout the world. So that seems like a pretty significant number. So the first question I want to ask, and we're going to ask Professor Stoddard to address this first, um, how do we square sort of that viewpoint of the film uh, international aid is, is counterproductive and, you know, those numbers about people leaving extreme poverty. Professor Stoddard. Can you guys hear me pretty well? Great. Um, so coincidentally and quite conveniently this morning, World Bank released a new report and um, the report says... Um, yeah, so we can just have uh, her slides up. Well. Uh, I'll it, tell you what it says. <laughs> it says that uh, extreme poverty, or the, the global go. population living under a dollar ninety a day, which is the threshold defined by the World Bank to mean uh, those living in extreme poverty, uh, for the first time since 1990, that number has uh, uh, has fallen be below 750 million people, and as you can see, it has been steadily declining over the years. In 1990 is when the World Bank first began collecting that data. Um, and so this is a pretty optimistic headline, right? Um, however, something that may be missed um, by um, those not used to reading these kinds of reports is another much more pessimistic statistic, which is that the growth rate um, of that decline in extreme poverty has actually slowed down quite considerably. So this most recent uh, decline, growth, uh, decline in the growth rate is only half of the growth rate of the previous years, and it's forecasted to continue to slow down. So the rate at which poverty is declining and slowing down is basically the big takeaway here. Um, and the film, of course, um, or I guess what I should say is both of these trends have taken place against the backdrop of increasing uh, foreign aid. So the way we define foreign aid usually is official development assistance, ODA. And this graph shows the amount of ODA over time. And as you can see, there's been a pretty consistent increase in the amount of foreign aid given uh, to developing countries. Um, in fact, in 2000, that amount was only about 70 billion U.S. dollars. We've more than doubled it now in 2016 with the latest data um, of uh, now foreign aid reaching uh, almost 143 billion U.S. dollars. So this question of whether aid is good or bad for development or for poverty alleviation is literally a $140 billion question, right? Um, and the film, as you saw in the preview, makes uh, a case rather strongly um, for aid essentially being bad for growth and hurting those that it's supposed to be helping. Now, uh, what I would say and, and what uh, sort of my initial reactions to the film um, have been is that um, the film largely ignores 
mounting evidence on the other side of that debate, that whether aid has been good or bad for growth is not a simple question. Um, and while the film makes a compelling case for, for the one side of this story, um, and provides a lot of anecdotal evidence and descriptive statistics. Um, it also largely ignores um, rigorous evaluations and studies that have shown that aid has contributed to alleviation of poverty in certain contexts, in certain regions. So I'll use a specific example um, um, just to, to uh, describe that point. Um, you saw in the preview a case of Tom's shoes. Um, and, and some anecdotal stories in the film are being described where um, this practice of giving away shoes and other kinds of goods for free hurts domestic local markets of developing countries. And the logic behind that is very sound. And theoretically, we can think of lots of stories for why that would be the case, why giving things for free to developing countries exacerbates their local economic problems. It suppresses local markets. Um, so the logic is certainly sound, but there have been many, many rigorous studies now conducted with models like Tom's Shoes that have actually shown that there is no statistically significant negative effect on these markets. Um, and these have been rigorous evaluations, and it's hard um, to then broad with a very, or paint with a very broad brush and say that all of models like Tom's Shoes uh, are bad for development. Um, and that's basically the biggest issue that I take with, with this film is, um, is this idea that all aid is bad for, for development. Aid comes in many different forms, shapes, and sizes. Um, aid has had uh, very different effects across different regions, across different countries, and uh, depending on the type of, of aid and different programs that have been uh, administered. Um, so, so just to conclude my opening remarks briefly, I would say that I do like uh, the fact that the film um, highlights the flaws of the current modern um, aid and development industry, um, but it certainly largely ignores the, the other side of this debate. And the our reasons to be optimistic about development and aid, uh, primarily the fact that we are using more evidence-based approaches, we're using more rigorous evaluations of different programs, which then will allow us to actually test whether different programs work or don't without having to spend 140 billion US dollars every year and not knowing what effect uh, we're having on developing countries. Uh, thank you very much. Um, one thing I neglected to, to tell you is that Professor Stoddard has a class. Uh, she's going to be needing to leave about halfway through our discussion. We're grateful uh, for this, but I'll just invite um, Scott and Todd to weigh in if you have any further comments to make. I'll try to weigh in quickly because we do want to hear a little bit more from Olio before she leaves. I, I think in general, you know, if I this film is not my favorite. I think it does. It paints too broad a perspective of what's wrong. It's easy to pick and cherry pick like they've done to say, look, here's things that are wrong, here's things that are good. The reality is it, it'd be nice to have a film that was about good development and bad development. The reality is, is you can pick multiple sectors of how development is being worked on in the world whether it's multilateral groups like the film talked about, whether it's uh, groups from each country like USAID or, or those from other countries in Europe, whether it's NGOs, whether it's social entrepreneurs, and each of them has groups who do it poorly, and each of them has groups who do it well. And so what we really need to learn, and, and I think this is what you were getting at, is how do we determine which is good and which is poor? To paint that all aid is is just something, and in fact, the way they describe it, it's it's this industry that exists to perpetuate this problem, and that's just not true. Okay, I'm going to play devil's advocate. Okay, so I'm going to tell you why this is a great film <laughs> and why this uh, it it paints an accurate picture of development. So one thing that this addresses in the films talked about patriarchy. 
and it talks about equality and a system in, in development that's based on this idea that people in the global north, largely the United States and the EU, have expertise, have goods, and that through the goodness of their heart, they're going to give it to the global south. And that creates an, an equal relationship, right? There's dependency inherent in this system. And this is one of the critiques of it. So even if you don't have inefficiencies in markets, if you, even if you don't have uh, negative impacts on local shoe makers, it perpetuates that dependency. It perpetuates this idea that there's poor people out there and we have to be these benevolent savers. To, and to illustrate this, this is something that we all are a part of in our own social norms, how we view the world, right? If you close your eyes and are honest and you think about someone from Africa, what comes to mind? Do you see someone poor? Do you see someone in need? Right? Those are social norms that we're raised in that's in part of what this movie's talking about, the social theory of development, that constructed this world of those that are developing and those are developed. Right? And even that can be a derogatory way of looking at the world. Someday you can be like us if we come and help you. And so that's where I think the strength of this film is, is not necessarily talk about efficiencies of products, because you could, it's true, it, pay, it cherry picks programs and we can have good data showing people doing things more efficiently, but it's addressing this idea of inequality and power dynamics, and that's still a very problematic issue that needs to be addressed when we're looking at development. Thanks. Any response to that? Just add to that? I love that point that Scott raises. And I think as Christians, so I often think, you know, teaching economic development at BYU, you know, you often hear different perspectives on sort of us versus them. Um, and, and I think as Christians, it's, it's, it, we need to remember that that is not an approach, or that is not the way Heavenly Father sees the poor and sees all of us, that we have all been created equal. Um, and this idea of paternalism, uh, I think, is something that we consciously need to, to stay away from. And the film does a good job emphasizing how damaging that can be to the psyche of the, of the poor in general. <laughs> yeah, well, let me, let, me, let me ask you this. Is there, this is just a question that comes to my mind. Is there a way then to, you know, again, they talk about, right, it's easy to have in, in the trailer, it's easy to have a, a good heart for the poor, right? The, the, the key is to have a good mind. Um, are there ways to try to help, right, with international development, and I know all three of you are studying this, that can avoid paternalistic power structures, or at least can try to not perpetuate them, but even break them down? Is there any, what, what are some of the issues in trying to do that? Sure, I don't know if I can speak much to paternalism. I leave that to both of you. But what I would advocate for, and what I've seen very, um, or increasingly commonly being advocated for among development economists, is this idea of rigorously evaluating all of development projects that instead of being sort of like the medieval midwife, you know, and using leeches to see whether they heal the patient or whether the patient dies, you know, we actually have science that can help us test rigorously whether programs work or not. We can randomize and, um, you know, that's for another discussion of exactly how we do that, but the randomized control trials, for example, that have become increasingly common in development studies that will allow us to see whether a program works, exactly what the cost effectiveness of a certain program is, and then we can scale up um, and generalize um, you know, on a broader scale to make sure that these uh, programs get um, uh, get rolled out on a broader scale. Um, so I've seen that advocated most commonly. Um, and in the case of development, uh, a very re uh, a most recent development has been with con with cash transfers, for example. So some of you have seen there's a an organization called Give Directly, which had this crazy idea ten years ago of what if we just people give people cash instead of actually thinking of what might the poor need and providing that for them, what if we just give them cash? Maybe that's a lot more cost effective. And there have now been hundreds of rigorous studies evaluating that, showing that in fact giving people cash under certain conditions is a lot more effective. People don't use that cash for things that we may think they might, like alcohol, tobacco, and other vice goods. They actually do use cash as a safety net and they use uh, those donations quite effectively. That 
also isolate or that eradicates sort of this middleman um, problem um, and helps poverty from that perspective. But again, evaluating these programs rigorously is something that I think is a, an important development in general uh, aid industry um, and is something that gives me a lot of hope uh, for the future. And I, I agree completely here. I think some of the things in the film that the film did get right is, is, you know, in my mind again, if I think about it, it's what's good development, what's poor development, and, and the notion of I can solve your problem, I can fix you, I'm your savior, that's a poor way of doing development. It often causes problems. And so what we need to do is then shift to what does good development look like and what it looks like is partnerships. It looks like people connecting and learning from each other about how to solve our joint problems. You know, this is, this is a problem we have all around our world. We have struggles with poverty here in Provo. And so we need to learn how to work together. We need to learn how to measure what we're doing so that we can understand what parts of our programs are working, which parts aren't. We need to take away this paternalistic savior approach. And, and, and so in my mind, I think it's part of the struggle with the film is, is it takes a very simple uh, look at something that's very complicated, right? I think you can kind of simplify it in some ways by looking at certain cases of development. We do development quite well when the solution is one item like a pill, like a vaccination, like a dose of you know, something that you take orally to keep you from getting polio, right? We've done very well when we can focus on, oh, the solution to this problem is actually quite well known. Now what we need to figure out is how do we get that thing to everyone? And that again, we've got to do it in a way where we're partnering with people, right? And, and then you look at the more complex issues like poverty, and there are so many facets that we've got to be careful how we do engage and that we don't engage in a way that you know, ends up causing more problems than good. And so I think in many ways we're all very much in agreement. We've been sending emails around and, and, uh, and trying to think through you know, what is it that makes uh, Good development versus not, and I, I think that's an approach we need to take. Yeah, I really like what they said too. Anytime someone says they have a simple solution to poverty or to a development problem, that should be a red flag that they they don't they're not they've not, haven't done their homework, right? <laughs> These are complex situations that take a lot of partnership, local partnership, and that's where you see the rise of grassroots movements, participatory development, recognizing that there are social norms. There's racial, gender issues that vary across communities that may be the reason why a project that worked in this village won't work in this village, right? And one thing I, I do like about the film is it brings up this idea of, of problematizing, and that's a very sociological term. And so you take something and you try to tease it apart to see if there's any problem with it. And food aid is really where, in the sociological literature, this word came about. Because you start off with this idea of food aid, what could be wrong with if we have surplus food, giving it to other people? Well, initially, in the rise of the food aid um, program, it was giving wheat to countries that didn't eat wheat, right? So in the 1950s and 60s, U.S. was growing wheat. We're going to export that to Korea, to Vietnam, Philippines, places that need it. And they, they, don't, they don't eat it, and it changed indigenous culture and it changed indigenous diet. So problematizing and just picking it out, that's the first way to say, hey, maybe we should start doing rice. And then you can see in the film, even giving rice can be problematic for it. So I think what, what the, the good thing is to, to realize there are solutions. And the evaluations, the random control trials, these are new methods we're using to try to be more and more precise. But we always want to kind of pause and think, is there anything we're missing? Is there a social aspect to this? And there's lots of things that we have going on on campus and other places that we can pause and we can think about, is this good or not? Just simply having good intentions doesn't mean you're going to get good outcomes, right? Get, gathering excess clothes and dumping it in the global south 
that may have been a good idea and a great service project for a family home evening for your singles ward, but that doesn't mean it's going to lead to good outcomes. We want to prob problematize it. Think about what could be the unintended negative consequences. And this film paints the development industry as, as if it's one big unintended consequence. <laughs> But there are lots of them out there, and we need, to be, we need to be willing to change and adjust our strategies. And that's where, for me, it's exciting to see the development community recognizing that and people being more limber and more adjustable with their programs. Thank you. Now, I think, uh, Professor Stoddard, you need to leave. Do you want to have any last word? Um, so, sorry, I did have a thought while uh, Scott was speaking, and that was there's absolutely no one-size-fits-all uh, these programs need to be customizable and need to take into account local institutions, local contexts, um, which the film largely ignores, um, but there are many organizations that try to do just that um, and, and to, you know, clearly they're evolving and they're learning and I like that the film emphasizes the idea that we need to be humble, we need to be self-aware about development, we can't take an approach that's, a, you know, th that sort of takes this headless heart perspective of we are doing good and how can you judge you know that good intention good intentions are not never going to be enough and we need to uh, make sure that we're always learning improving and evolving in this industry thank you very much appreciate your participation um, all right well one, one of the things now this this is very good I like this emphasis on local things one of one of you see it here at the end of the trailer too that what the film identifies or the the sort of spokespeople that are in the film identify as maybe the major problem is the issue of exclusion, that a lot of developing countries are excluded from participating in the market, that it's kind of going back to what, Scott, what you were saying, that the system is kind of rigged for the Global North participants. Um, can you address that issue? Is that something that, is, does that ring true to you? Um, and if so, what are, what are some possible solutions for that? Um, I don't know, Todd, I know you're, you're in the Marriott School. Is that something that you encounter in the Ballard Center? Is that an issue that you address? Yeah, we can talk about that, too, if you want to start. Yeah. So th one of the issues uh, is when you think about development, there's different ways of talking about it. And you need to understand, are you talking about economic development, political development, social development? What modifier are you going to use? And when we look at power dynamics, we look at relative positions globally, that's where this, this idea of patriarchy and, and uh, inequality persists. If we look at see who the global powers are, that hasn't really changed much in over a century. And in fact, this is where this idea of neocolonialism comes in, is that the relationships you have, the trade that you have, it's still, you're still dependent on global north markets. So my 340 class, we talk about Ecuador. Ecuador makes a lot of money exporting bananas but they, all, they need the United States to, to buy those bananas. And even if Ecuador improves, makes money off of it, um, they're still dependent. They're still that subservient uh, nation to that. And so this is this idea when we're looking at power dynamics, has it actually improved? And that's where if you wanted to critique the, the earlier slides about poverty has, has gone down, um, but has there really been any shift in global power dynamics? Right? Uh, and this is this idea that we're going to give you a little bit so you get out of poverty, but we're going to extract more out of this. And I think you see this right now where the global north, lots of countries have shifted more towards populism and towards protective policies in their nations. Brexit, uh, the United States has moved that way. Sweden, other m nations have moved towards more protective industries. The trade war that's going on right now with the U.S. and China is we're going to protect the United States at the cost of other countries, right? Uh, and, and even what's, what's pointed out in the, the movie, um, that you have this export of U.S. agricultural goods that's then dumped on the global south market and causes all this disruption to indigenous markets there. This is potentially what's going to happen with the trade war right now. China is taxing U.S. agricultural goods. The 2018 agricultural bill gave $1.3 billion to U.S. agricultural subsidies. So the government's going to buy an extra $1.3 billion of agricultural goods that typically was bought in Chinese markets. And what do you think is going to happen with that? It's probably going to get dumped on the global market in, in the coming years, and it's going to have a negative <coughs> impact on it. It's going to keep that power dynamic between the global north, those that are empowered, and those in the global south being dependent on that. 
And so that's, that's where this critique is. And so you need to be asking yourself, am I, ask, am I looking about market efficiencies? Because we've improved market efficiencies. We've improved quality of life. But when we look at power dynamics and who really has the say and has the, can dictate what the terms of development and trade are, that hasn't really changed. And that's where you can have a critical perspective on development. You know, one thing I, I, I think is, is helpful for all of us to try to think about when we are looking at this is to simplify this and to think about how we are engaged in this. Um, the sponsoring church for this university is focused on people becoming self-reliant. And one of the questions is, how do we help people do that? Do we do that for them? Do we do that with them? Is it something they do on their own, right? These are questions that are difficult because we start to look at humans and the complexity of human life, the complexity of all the facets of someone that we might feel like we need to help. Maybe we're a parent and we're hoping that our child becomes self-reliant. Maybe we're a grandparent feeling the same way. And we've got to be able to step back and think about how we participate in a way that doesn't actually discourage what we're trying to do, right? We've all sensed and heard stories or know of family members where perhaps parents or others, the community has indulged people and then there's a dependency created. I, I think it's helpful, again, at any rate, if we were to think about how does this occur in my own life? What's going on today? How do I participate in this? Each of you are being aided to attend this university. And what a fantastic thing it is that you're here. And so what we need to think through is, when is that appropriate? When is it good? How does it work? And then I think it helps, at least in my mind, to understand that and then to extrapolate, to think about what is going on in our global system. And the same struggles exist. We have a tendency to, to become emotionally engaged without really thinking through, evaluating through, theorizing, determining, understanding, or just learning from what's happened in the past. We tend to think, I've invented this, this is the best thing that needs to happen, and, and here's what we need to do. I, I love what Scott mentioned a while ago. You know, there's, there's easy red flags. And red flags are when, when an organization tells you we know the right way to do this. Well, an organization has a current way of doing it, and they need to be able to change and improve. And those are the kinds of organizations we should be engaged with, are the ones who are open and see themselves um, and recognize they may be doing things wrong because that's the reality of what is happening. So I think it helps to just take it a step closer to ourselves and think about how have people helped me to be self-reliant and when have people actually caused that not to happen as well and, and what does that look like? I think it's just another way to think about it. Well, thank you. Um, where we're already uh, spent, you know, gone through quite a bit of our hour here. Um, let, me, let me ask you this question. This is something that, Scott, you brought up. And uh, I'll ask this question, and then this will lead into, um, we'll open it up to questions uh, from you. Um, and so before I ask my question, let me just explain how we're going to work that. Um, if you have a question uh, for our panelists here, uh, please come up to this microphone to ask it. Uh, the reason for this is you, you may say, well, I have a very loud voice and everyone in this room is going to hear me. And that's probably true. But uh, remember, this is being recorded and your voice will not be captured on the recording unless you're standing here. So we'll invite you to come up here. And when you do, when you, before you ask your question, please tell us your name and your major. Um, and then I'm sure they'd be happy to, uh, to answer your questions. I'll also tell you that typically we'll, what we'll do is we'll allow the, that question part of it to go if there are enough, if there are continue to be questions up to the top of the hour until one, but we know that many of you may have a class at one o'clock and we'll need to leave at, at 12.50. So 
will sort of uh, excuse you at that point. But here's the question to sort of get us started on this. Um, Professor Sanders mentioned that you know there, we may be doing things ourselves, right, here on campus or in our own lives that contribute to some of these problems. And on the other hand, we know Professor Stoddard's talked about this, Professor Manwaring, right, right, that there are also things that are happening on our campus to try to make a more positive uh, contribution to improve our abilities um, with international aid. So I'm just going to invite both of you to sort of address both of those sides. What are some of the negative things that happen here uh, in, in these kinds of questions, and what are some of the positive things? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try to think about some of the more positive ones here for a moment. Um, I think if, if as students and as faculty and getting engaged at BYU, there are a number of places that we can connect in trying to understand um, how to participate in the development of um, all of us here in this world as God's children. There are a number of minors. There's a civic engagement minor. There's an international development minor. There's a nonprofit minor. There's a number of emphasis in various programs. Um, if Olga was still here, she could mention that in the econ um, program, there's now an emphasis in development. Um, that, that kind of emphasis exists in, in many other programs, uh, in a few graduate programs. Um, the Ballard Center is focused on, that, that I run, is focused on helping students to understand what is going on with organizations who are trying to create an innovative approach to solving some of these problems. And, and our belief is that by understanding how those organizations approach that, we can understand all of the organizations better who are trying to solve social problems. Um, at BYU, the fourth aim of a BYU education talks about students learning how to participate in solving family, community, religious, and social problems. And I, my sense of what's happening on campus is that there's a, there's a growth and a focus on how we learn how to participate in that, where perhaps in the past there was a focus on, um, or maybe not a focus, but just a sense of we just need to volunteer our way through this. And instead, you can think about what are the programs I could be participating in at the Kennedy Center that would help me participate in life and throughout life to help solve social problems. And, uh, and so my sense is there's a lot of great programs that, that are growing at BYU. Students are very interested in understanding how they can participate. And my sense is we're learning how to, I, I think the film described this quite well, we're learning how to bring our, our head, our mind into what normally has just been something where we feel a need, we feel an emotional tug, but really thinking through how do we participate. One last thing in that fourth aim of view education, it talks about how we do that. And it mentions that students should be involved using their knowledge and skills. And so each and every major on campus can be engaged, but we want the film student figuring out how to tell good film stories. We want the sociology student to learn how they can participate in digging in and helping us understand what's working and what's not. We want the strategy student focusing on those strategy portions. Each of us come at this with different skills, and this is something that, on the one hand, is growing in multiple places on campus, but it's, a, it's something that our campus is focused on, on the broadest of terms. We want every student to participate in solving social problems. I think that's great. Um, I really like what Todd said. There's a lot of programs on campus that you can get involved in. Kennedy Center, Ballard Center, the, the study abroad fair that's going to be coming tomorrow, right? Tomorrow um, uh, morning, afternoon. There's lots of opportunity within majors, and especially now with the experiential learning funds, 
uh, students can get like really hands-on, fantastic experience. And so I think there, look at that. I challenge you all to look in your majors, the minors, and all these different centers to look at that. Uh, individually, I think there's, then I'm going to speak a little bit about how as an individual you might be able to do it outside the BOU context. So uh, when you want to go give, um, you know, some effort, some volunteer effort, what can be a better way um, or more effective way? I think first of all, like avoid the dump and run kind of programs. Like we're going to collect, use books, use computers, and we're going to go dump it once. Good programs, good projects are long-term efforts, uh, and they don't have to be really, uh, you know, hard or complex. One thing that um, you know our, our neighborhood does, my wife helps set up, is they do lunches for the Food and Care Coalition every other, they do it tw twice a month. And the big thing is they talk about how much of an impact this group has had. It's because they've done it for two years. They do it every two weeks, every month, uh, for two years now to the point where the Food and Care Coalition knows we're going to get this every time from these groups so we can start shifting resources to other places. Well, the movie talks about it's hard for areas to adjust to these big dumps and then nothing, and another big dump. So being consistent, finding organizations that have long-term uh, ties in whatever group you want to work in, internationally, domestic, women's health, poverty, finding long-term committed organizations is, is really helpful. And then also what I encourage you to do is look to use your efforts to improve another organization, right? There's a lot of really good organizations already out there. And students, I understand this, want to be, I want to be the founder, I want to be the president, I want to start this, I want to go back to my mission and help out. We'll do some homework and see if there's already an organization that's been there, has ties, and can be there long after you graduate from BYU. And those are the ways I think you can take the efforts, the heart you already have, and really amplify those efforts and be more effective. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, um, any questions from uh, the audience? Again, invite you to uh, come up here to the microphone. <laughs> we have a few. Yes, please. Hi, this is Lewis. I'm an econ major in uh, minor in international development. So, I coincidentally watched this movie on Saturday, and one thing they emphasized was that trade is the best way to get out of poverty. So, coming from like an economic perspective, what do you think about that statement? Like, the best way to get out of poverty is through free trade. So I'm a sociologist, and I've done research showing that trade has helped out. Um, but I, I think it's not a panacea. That's the issue, right? And how you engage in trade. Um, that would be if you, you know, playing off of poor economics. But I think a lot of the growth that we've seen, um, like Olga po pointed out, is because of trade. The question is, is how the inequality. I think that's the second issue we're starting to get now. Is, is, is this a trade-off? Like I give you some food, but I, I take a hundred thousand dollars salary out of it. So that's the, the issue about uh, trade. Where I think we could improve now is the equitability of the distribution of profits. Yeah, that's a good answer. <laughs> My name is Joanna Reed and I'm a psychology major and my question was, are there any countries that have been in poverty and that have risen out of it and become self-sustaining that we can learn from while we are searching for more solutions to help the other countries? Yeah, I think there are a lot of good examples. Um, you know, a great film um, that I would suggest to dig into this just a little bit and get a different side of this is it's a film by Hans Rosling called Don't Panic, How to End Poverty in 15 Years. Um, now, he's also a little bit one-sided in his approach, but he talks about many of these countries. He talks about South Korea, how South Korea moved from a situation, you know, during and right after the Korean War to being one of the, you know, most developed countries in our world today. We have a lot of the tiger economy groups in, in Asia, and we have a lot of upcoming countries. So there are a number of places we can go looking at. I think the struggle and, and how it, it, it doesn't um, just map on to what we're doing is each of them have done it in slightly different ways. And so there's different contexts, there's different cultural aspects that are happening. And so it's not an easy map, but I think it helps us understand that yes, poverty is complex and each of them approached it in some similar ways and in some different ways. Uh, my name is Hunter Davies. I'm a political science major. Uh, my question, you were talking about uh, power dynamics and how the global north and global south, how that works. I was wondering if there have been any examples of countries that have been able to break those power dynamics that are based
basically ingrained into the system. Uh, the Asian tigers would be an example. Maybe China would be the, the other one because it's starting to challenge as a global hegemonic power. Um, but you can certainly point to a lot of the former colonial um, nation states in Africa and South America as examples of entrenchment of those powers. But there are India might be another one that you could potentially argue. And, and India would be an interesting one to look at because it's, it's in this process, right? where China's further along, some of these other countries are much further along, and so it'd be a place to be looking at what is occurring today and how they're doing it. My name's Andrew Reed. Um, I'm from Washington, D.C., and I'm a, a film major. Uh, you guys actually answered part of my question already. Uh, my dad's from Korea, and his, I mean, his parents and you know, their family, I mean, grew up in pretty much like abject poverty. Um, I guess, what would you say were some of the reasons that enabled Korea to kind of have the success that it has now? I, one thing I'll just add, I, I guess, or, or start with, I think one, one aspect that most countries have done who have been able to move quickly is that they've been focused on training and educating youth, right? These countries all started looking at how do we help people, how do we develop the, the, the children, how do we develop the youth, because that's the growth that's going to occur in this country is people who have learned and understand and then can apply um, and, and, and be part of the solution even better than others who haven't. Yeah, so the Asian tigers, you have the first generation where it's cheap labor, come real factories, you have the same thing going to China, but they invested heavily in education, now that second generation are highly skilled labor force. But the thing to, comp to problematize that, to make it more complex, is to look at like the African nation states and how health issues, uh, HIV, Ebola, other things have plagued those countries, so they haven't been able to follow a similar path. So that's where it's, there's models, but we can't broadly adapt them because of all these other uh, competing factors. Hi, my name is Kate Foster, and I'm a sociology major with a minor in nonprofits. And so, I guess my question is: There's a lot of organizations that go into different countries, and they teach self-reliance. They teach women how to sew, or they teach them how to farm in a different, a different way. So, I was just wondering if there's any negative consequences of that, whether it be on the society or on their cultures as well. I, you know, my answer would be: I think it depends how it's approached, right? Mm -hmm. So if it's we're here, we're gonna we're gonna change what you do and how you do it, and uh, then I think it, it can be problematic. But I think when we participate, I, I I like what Scott said when we participate in a very sustainable way. We're there each week, we're there each month, we're there each year, participating and learning together. Uh, I think that can be something beautiful because we do have things to share, but we also have a lot to learn. And so I think a lot of it is, how is it done? And how is it working? And this is the importance of a continued evaluation. I worked with an NGO that's done agricultural training. Farmers make all this extra money, but what it ended up doing is creating more polygamy in an area. And that was, a, that was something that they didn't want to have happen. But because of an ongoing evaluation, they discover this. And now they're grappling with, so what do we do? And so that's, that's the whole thing, is being, being willing to adjust your model and, and to measure it looking for ways that you might be having unintended consequences. I'm Ryan, I'm Ryan Sheen, I'm majoring in international relations, and you answered my question a little bit, um, but I was wondering what we as average people can do um, to identify like the, the companies and the efforts that will actually help com uh, countries develop uh, what we can do to donate or to serve that will actually make a positive impact. I think one of the deepest things each of us can do, if we really want to get engaged and involved, we need to learn how to love the problem, not the solutions. And so I think what we need to do is recognize and understand what is it that I care about and then really learn what's really happening, what's going on, how did this occur? What's been, what's, what have people been doing for 50 years focusing on trying to change this? I think by focusing on understanding and really getting into a problem rather than saying, I'm just gonna go solve something, I think that's when we become 
more close to being a participant rather than someone who's just coming in with some ideas. So I think it's, it's you know, it's, it's apprenticing with a problem, it's marinating with a problem and really understanding it well, that's when we can, I think, be at our best in participating. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Find a problem you're interested in and invest in it and then try to find organizations that have invested in it as well. So my name is Matt, I'm a geography major. And my question was, you touched on kind of the trend, nationalistic trends of, for instance, Great Britain and our, our own country. Um, so my question would be, from an economic development standpoint, how do you find a healthy way for us to balance, I guess, in, in situations when the two might, might butt heads, um, our own national development with international development and our responsibility as United States citizens with citizens of a global community? That's a good question, and that's you know the individual to flush that out. Do do you want if if a country is going to claim moralism and claim claim that we are there to help other people, then it needs to have policies and practices that back that. And and the one of the challenges with international development is that you have changing regimes, changing preferences within the global North countries as well as the global South countries. So having a consistent policy, whether that's international development or trade or agricultural growth varies radically um, and that's one of the you know problems within global south is not having consistent political regimes but you can see how the power dynamics and dictates of the global north can also have their impact on it but i think i th you know it's not unjust for a country want to want to have their own self-interest it's just then they may maybe can't have that same moralistic position that they want to claim um, i'm joseph peterson i'm an exercise science major and you had mentioned earlier that the issue is not really black and white like there, like the film portrays. There are some um, organizations that do a lot of good, where there are some that may be doing more harm than good. Has there been like a change in that? Like, have there been less organizations that are having a negative impact in recent years? I don't know that answer. Yeah. I think what I do know is that in the last 20 years, we've all become more aware of this, and there are more measurements going on trying to understand the efficacy of various programs. Um, I don't know that I've seen reports describing uh, the number of good programs versus poor and how that's compared. I, I don't know that I've noticed any of those. Yeah, and that's also subjective, what's good, what's bad. There's been a, the, the movie argues, and I don't have data to back up, and, but it seems correct that there's a, been a proliferation of NGOs and nonprofits in recent years, and I, that seems accurate to me, and it, what percentage are good or bad, I don't know. Renata, do you have an answer to that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. okay, well, let's, let's finish up with the people who are in line there, um, and that will be our last question. So the three of you, yeah, please. My name is Ellie, I'm an economics major. Um, and I was just, I know Professor Stoddard was saying, was talking about the fault in prescribing a one-size-fits-all approach to these aid programs. So my question for you guys is, what's the most important factor in establishing adaptability in these programs? I would say good data measurement, right? Going in with a plan that we have, we take good baseline measurements and we're consistently taking that and then being willing to adjust it. I think that's where the random control trials evaluation, that's what we're getting better and better at, is, is getting this and being able to assess it. Um, I mean, that's, how, but there's lots of answers to that, but I think that would be the most important thing, is that you're getting good objectable, you know, objective data that you can then make sound um, decisions and assessments off of. And I, I'd agree with that. I think that the, the organizations that I participate with that I feel like are doing well and are constantly improving, they're improving because they are trying to measure, they're trying to understand what's happening, and, and they're better able to make shifts based on data and information rather than subjective thoughts, anecdotal evidence. So I think that's very true. And let me just add, like, the consulting I've done with the NGOs, every NGO knows they need to collect data, and you'll go to an NGO and they'll hand you spreadsheet after spreadsheet after spreadsheet that you can't do anything with. So they have all these numbers, but if it actually translates to measuring an outcome or something you can actually do with, that's the difference. And that's where people are getting better and better at understanding, this is how I collect data that's actually going to give me answers. My name's Ellen. I'm 
Lauren Borog. I'm undecided on my major right now. Um, but I'm wondering if you guys know what the correlation between treatment of women is in these countries and the poverty levels, and if there's any correlation between the two of those. I don't know the specifics. I know they're general um, papers that are talking about correlations between improved political freedom and improved economic freedom. Um, and anytime you can empower 50% of the population, that seems like a good thing, but I couldn't give you a specific citation or statistic. Thank you. I, I, yeah, and I would just stress it's, What's just, that? it's really Valerie important. Hudson. Yeah, Valerie Hudson stuff, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think there are, are studies that have shown that countries that are, that better enable women to participate and be part of the economy, be part of the political discussions, they're the economies that, and countries that are doing better than others as a whole. My name is Kyler Haig, I'm an electrical engineer, engineering major. Um, so I was wondering, I feel like every time that um, poverty is brought up, it's like on a global scale, but I'm more vested in I'm more invested in the United States and kind of the people around us. And I was just wondering with, with what efforts are put forward to the world, like are there similar efforts in the United States like among the ghetto class of the people in every city that we find? So I do research on poverty in the U.S. as well. Um, there's, uh, there's, there's efforts being made, but there's still barriers to it. For example, when we look at working poverty, households that are working, half the people below the poverty line have a job. Um, and so maybe the, world, the, the American dream that if you work, you can have a, a living standard isn't there. So depending on your perspective, there's certainly improvements that could be made. The U.S. actually has a very problematic poverty line because it's a combination of income and household size which makes it difficult, and then geographic variance. So if you're making 60,000 in Kansas and 60,000 in San Francisco, two different worlds, right? So it's complex, um, but I think there's a lot of brilliant people working on it. Um, and again, it's political wins is the issue with, with that. I think just, you know, something I would I'd bring up, it, it really is this very similar, right? There's a, organizations trying to work Domestically, I think it's easier. It'd be an easier approach for most of us to connect locally and be more engaged in understanding a problem because we can actually be there, see it more frequently, and participate. Um, but you know, this is—it's it's a provo problem. This isn't a their problem. We're we're talking about global because that's part of what this film's focus is. But certainly, if we look at, at how do we help our brothers and sisters around this world, there's people in your own ward who struggle. There's people in, um, you know, certainly here in Provo and other places right near us who are struggling with food, who are struggling with jobs, who are struggling with income, who are struggling with health, addiction, high school dropouts, right? I mean, there's. There are so many problems here locally as well as globally. And, and I think the, the biggest thing we can do, the most um, advantageous thing we can do is, is to really engage and become as close as we can an expert on what's happening in an issue and then participate in it. Yep. Right, well thank you very much. Thank you for your attendance. Uh, please join me in thanking Professor Sanders, Manwaring, and Stoddard. Hey, join us again next week. We'll have a very interesting uh, lecturer talking about social justice in South Africa. That's good. Thanks, Tom. That's fun. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. It's great. Just, uh, just I think that was great, great discussion. But I was. Uh, it's too bad. I'll go good and stay the whole time. Yeah. 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 Thank you. You're welcome.